Hey guys, uh, Woodruff here, and hopefully this lecture will be a lot less painful than the dysrhythmia one. I know that one was super long and super confusing, but this is why it's so nice to then, after you do a long, multiple hour lecture on dysrhythmias and EKG, to then do a short, sweet, simple, to the point, it may only last an hour, hopefully less than that, um, beautiful lecture for heart failure. And heart failure is one of my favorite heart diseases. It's a very sad one, but also sad because the heart's failing and it's very, um, you know, there's no cure and stuff like that, but it's a very interesting topic. And if you find the heart interesting, I think you're going to love heart failure like I do. So um, just the disclosures, this is a long lecture. So this is not um, short, sweet, simple to the point. I have better short, sweet, simple videos. You can check through the playlist to look for those. Um, this is more of a long lecture for those that maybe missed lecture, aren't in my lecture, um, were in my lecture and still feel like they missed everything because there's too much content because we do dysrhythmias first and then go into this and so you're dead inside. So needless to say, hopefully um, this will help you one way or another. If you just like a glutton for punishment, you just love learning about heart failure multiple times. So what's really the problem here in heart failure? Um, so heart failure, like the name suggests, is it's a failure of the um, heart to be able to move blood forward. So before we were talking about electrical problems, heart failure is a, a mechanical problem or a problem with the muscle of the heart. And it's a weakness of the muscle, um, a pumping problem where effectively those beautiful ventricles that should be able to pump blood forward um, have lost that ability and they're weak. And so what happens is um, the way I think that is great to visualize it, because um, I'm a very literal person, I like to kind of see things in my head, um, is think of it like um, congestion on I-35 um, or we know wherever you live if you're not you know in Texas um, but if you're on 35 and there's congestion what happens like you know you're driving to try to go somewhere a car stop like there's traffic the car is stopped and then what happens is cars just start backing up behind it and everyone stopped and it's the same thing for um, heart failure is effectively fluid um, starts getting like kind of stuck or pooling in places because um, it's unable to move forward and then there's nowhere else for it to go. So it starts backing up. And this leads to a lot of problems um, because um, it, where it's backing up into can lead to a lot of complications and it really affects quality of life. And all of the extra fluid leads to more and more problems. We're gonna get into it, but yeah, so it leads to a lot of issues, but it all leads back to this pumping problem that the heart is not strong enough in order to pump blood forward. Um, and um, as a result, of that um, it leads to the big the big so what here is is like okay well then I'm not getting blood if, I'm, if it's not if it's moving it's, and it's not necessarily moving backwards but it's backing up and it's um, pooling um, and things like that so it's not moving forwards so therefore I'm not getting that oxygenated beautiful blood out to my tissues to perfuse the tissue so the big issue here is cardiac output I'm not getting cardiac output or um, blood out to the rest of my body to my organs to my tissues to provide oxygenation um, so my main risk factors for heart failure are going to be high blood pressure and um, uh, what do you call it? coronary artery disease. And so um, anyone that's had a heart attack is going to be at, at risk for heart failure because a lot of times um, part of the muscle can die or um, have serious issues after a um, heart attack. And so um, they have less muscles that are actually functioning, working well, or they have, um, you know, they can have more dead tissue after a heart attack. And then with hypertension, um, if going back to what we talked about in hypertension, hypertension increases the vascular resistance or the amount of resistance the heart has to overcome to pump blood forward. And so as a result of that, it can create extra pressure, which can make it harder on the heart. Um, even though these are not necessarily risk factors, commonly um, what people also have along with their heart failure are going to be things like diabetes, um, metabolic syndrome, which is that um, we haven't learned about it yet, but um, it's effectively like you have a lot of risk factors like high cholesterol, high blood glucose, um, what's the other waist circumference, because we measure like we measure obesity by waist circumference, then there's the lipid levels and blood sugar, I want to say is the three, I could be completely making it up, but probably not, I usually like it's amazing when I'm not trying so hard to think about things what just randomly is just sticking in my brain, but we'll learn about it more later, but just know like think metabolic syndrome, um, think of people that are like um, obese or have a lot of cardiovascular risk factors, um, older age, um, 
as you get older, you're going to be at higher risk because your heart has done a lot of really good work. Um, smoking, vasoconstrictor, it's always going to be harder on the um, cardiovascular system and any sort of vascular disease because if my um, heart has to overcome a lot of resistance, it's going to be hard. And, um, you know, other causes, you know, you just have to think about anything that's going to mess with cardiac output. So if I have a volume problem, if I have any sort of resistance issues, like I said, those blood vessel issues, um, if there's anything that affects my heart. So if I get an infection in my heart, um, uh, like, you know, like we can talk about like congenital heart diseases, we can talk about um, like infective endocarditis, we could talk about, and these are a lot of stuff that you're going to learn about, like later on in future semesters, we could talk about like rheumatic fever, um, things like like that. They can all lead to my heart muscle being sick, cardiomyopathies, you know, I could go on structural disorders, any sort of inflammation of the heart. All of these can lead to the heart muscle being weak and not being able to contract as well. And then heart rate issues. So if I have um, a problem with my, and going back to dysrhythmias, which I know you miss so much, um, if I have a problem with my um, SA note or my pacemaker of my heart, um, and it's, it's either going too fast, too slow, or there's something going on um, where I'm having a dysrhythmia, um, then it can lead to decreased cardiac output issues and um, put strain on the heart. So effectively, anything that strains the heart, and the heart is such a strong organ and does so much for the body, but it has its weak spots too, and it can only put up with so much. So um, what happens in heart failure is, um, you know, the heart has such an important role to get blood out to the rest of the body to get perfusion and oxygen to my tissues. Um, so, you know, when this is not working, when this starts to go into failure, the body's not going to just be like, oh, oh, well, the heart's failing. Um, it starts to try to compensate and it's super smart, super um, effective usually in doing this. Uh, and the thing with these compensations is in the beginning, early on, these um, compensations are super helpful. It works really well. Cause like, I mean, what these compensations are meant to do is to help me when you know, things aren't going so well for a short period of time. But if I'm needing long-term, like just long-term, I'm not doing well, I'm needing constant help and these constant compensations, they can actually start to cause more problems than they are helping. So um, what you wanna look at here with heart failure, um, with these compensations is um, the, the two main compensations that we have are um, you know, given to us by the kidneys and what is known as the renin angiotensin aldosterone system or the RAS and then the sympathetic nervous system. And what I mean by that is, is that the sympathetic nervous system doesn't live in the kidneys, but when the kidneys are not getting perfusion, they stimulate both of these things because they are very selfish, sensitive organ and they want their flow. So when they don't get their flow, they're like, hey, I'm not working for nothing. I am going to get me some more sodium. I'm going to get me some more water and um, I'm going to constrict some blood vessels to get more cardiac output. And that's what the RAS does. We have more sodium, more water, more vasoconstriction. It also stimulates the sympathetic nervous system increases my heart rate. And the theory there, you know, the heart's like, Hey, if I'm pumping faster, I'm going to get more output out to get those, um, you know, oxygenation to my tissues. Um, and then also when it comes to, um, it also helps to vasoconstrict as well um, to hopefully get more cardiac output. So these again are great. And if I like, you know, had a, a transient need for this, it would be great. But long-term, if I'm constantly in a state of fight or flight, if I'm constantly holding on to more fluid and um, sodium, it's going to really start causing some problems. Um, we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, the other thing the heart tries to do is what we call um, ventricular remodeling or bulking up. Um, um, and so like, you know, effectively it's um, the muscles thickening and you would think, hey, this is, you know, going to be really helpful because I, my problem is I have this weak muscle. I just need a stronger muscle. But here's the thing. Thicker is not necessarily better in this situation. Look at this picture. Look at normally. This is how, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, not normal. I don't want to say normally because I want to say. These are talking about enlarged ventricles. So I think this might be something abnormal too. But um, normally there's a lot more space here in the ventricles for, um, uh, wait, because yeah, I think this is something abnormal too, but just know normally like, you know, compared to this B, there's a lot more space usually in the ventricles um, to allow for um, actual filling. Because here's the problem is at the end of the day, even though the, there's this like big old thick muscle here, one, 
it's a thick muscle, but it's still weak. It just because it's thicker doesn't mean it's stronger. So I always think of those guys that go around, they have those really, really big muscles just because they have big muscles doesn't necessarily mean they're strong. So you always have to kind of keep in mind, um, you know, like the thickness of the heart doesn't mean that it's not still having a problem. The other issue is here, look at how small these chambers are in order to have good cardiac output. Part of that equation, which I think we're going to talk about here in a minute, um, is that I have to have enough volume. And if I don't have space in order for that, um, the fluid to fill in the ventricles in order to pump out to my body, what good are they? Like I could have the strongest muscle in the world, but if I don't have the space, the capacity to even fill up with fluid, how helpful am I? Um, so these are some ways that it tries to come to Like I said, in the beginning, it's really helpful, but then it starts working against me. So first I have this increased heart rate. So, you know, and we talked about this when we talked about dysrhythmias is that an increased heart rate and maybe initially or a little bit elevated can help. But once I get so high, I have no time for filling. And on top of the fact, I have no time for filling and I have no space here with this, you know, enlarged, um, ventricle and this, um, you know, like less space, um, there's actual less room to fill. So this is going to make it even harder for me to get cardiac output. And on top of that, having an increased heart rate over time, that sympathetic nervous system activation, it exhausts my heart. It increases the workload. Um, and increases the amount of, um, what do you call it? Um, oxygen and stuff that I'm consuming. It is working so hard. Uh, with the RAS, I am going to be holding on to more fluid and more sodium. And so it seems like that's what I need, but I don't have a problem where I don't have enough fluid in heart failure. I have too much fluid because I'm, my fluid is backing up and going in the wrong direction or in all the wrong places. Um, and so, and then to have that plus then to be adding more, that's going to make it even worse. So um, I know we, we always talk about this Frank Starling's law and everyone hates it because they're like, I, I get it, but I don't. But here's the thing, like this is the overall picture is, is that, um, Fluid is stretch. And so the more um, fluid is stretch, fluid is volume, fluid is pressure. So like the more fluid I have, the more heart stretch, the more pressure that I have in my heart, um, the more volume that I have in my heart. Um, that might seem like a good thing because it seems like, hey, I'm low on cardiac output, which involves volume. But here's the thing is I, when I have all this extra stretch in my heart, what happens is that as the heart stretches, the, the need for um, the demand for oxygen increases. So in other words, the more fluid stretch that I had, the more volume stretch that I have in my heart, the more oxygen my body is gonna start to demand. So in other words, this is gonna increase the workload of that heart and make it work even harder. Um, we talked a little bit about um, how RAS and sympathetic nervous system vasoconstrict or narrow those blood vessels. Now, again, um, <clears throat> having narrow blood vessels doesn't necessarily mean better flow. And so when we have this systemic vascular resistance that's increased or these constricted blood vessels, what's happening is the heart is again, like going back to that um, analogy when we talked about hypertension of the heart trying to take, um, blah, 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 uh, what is it called? Um, uh, like trying to take a jug of milk and pour it into a funnel. And so it's like, I have this, I have, I could have a great amount of volume, a strong pumping heart, but if I'm trying to push it into a funnel, it's going to make it so hard for that milk to get poured into that funnel. Um, so there's resistance. It's all about too much resistance in the blood vessels. And then the heart is working so hard to pump out against those narrow, narrow vessels. Um, and then we have either thick, um, like, so I think this is what this picture is showing. Cause I, as soon as like I was saying, it, I was like, okay, this is like a dilated ventricle with heart failure. And this is a, like a hypertrophied one. Um, but either way, so it can either be like thin and weak, or it can be thick and weak. It doesn't matter, but either way, like they're weak, stiff. There's not like, even in this one where they're more dilated ventricles with heart failure, just know that that doesn't mean stronger. So they could be like skinny and weak. So kind of think of someone who's like malnourished or hasn't like been working out a lot or gotten a lot of strength. They're weak. They're not able to contract. So even though they have the space in order to accommodate fluid if they don't have the strength. And same, I could have the strength, but not the space. I could also have no strength and no space. <laughs> so um, th there's a lot of problems here that my muscle is weak. It can be dilated. It can be hypertrophied, um, but it's weak and stiff and it cannot contract. It cannot move that blood forward. And I have all this fluid going on. I have this resistance I'm fighting against. My heart is racing and working, 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 trying to help me pump more and just um, increasing that oxygen demand. So I have this extreme imbalance of all these, my heart's having all this need, this high workload um, and uh, um, you know, not enough oxygen and stuff to meet it because I'm not getting good cardiac output. Um, early on, and this is something that can be a misconception, you know, 
early on, the blood pressure is usually going to be high because we're compensating um, with heart failure. But later on, um, as time goes on, it is going to get low. And so, um, you know, this is going to come into play when we're talking about heart failure. Uh, you know, early on when we give like hypertension meds, part of my goal with hypertension meds um, is to maybe help with their blood pressure, but we use them for other reasons too. And this will make more sense when we talk about it in a minute, but just um, keep in mind that um, with heart failure, a lot of the treatments that we're using, um, we just want to look at really how, why are we giving this med? How is it helping this patient? So we'll talk about it here soon. Oh, I'm getting a little excited. <clears throat> so there's two types of heart failure. Um, there's left-sided and right-sided heart failure. And this kind of goes back to, um, or I haven't talked about it yet. I always forget like what, what since I'm doing this in the summer, um, what I've recorded and what I have not yet. We'll talk about the same thing with stroke. When I go in and get report on a patient with heart failure, I'm not like, hey, is it left-sided or right-sided? Because at the end of the day, um, it doesn't really matter. Like left-sided versus right-sided, like, what I say it doesn't matter is, is that I want to see what the symptoms are. So same with the stroke, like they can tell me, Hey, they had a left-sided or a right-sided stroke. Okay. Where's their weakness? What deficits do they have? So we'll talk about that more later. So it's the same thing here because a lot of patients that have left-sided heart failure, it's just in real life, you're not going to have these textbook images where, Hey, it's left-sided. They only have a problem in their lungs. Hey, right-sided. They only have fluid in the rest of their body. Like most patients with heart failure, they have a variety. Like they might have both because left-sided usually leads to right-sided heart failure. Um, so just know like, it's not that it's not important, but um, cause it's definitely going to affect treatment and left-sided, you know, is obviously um, leads to different problems than right-sided. Um, but just know like in nursing school, we're gonna want you to differentiate these and say, hey, these are the symptoms of left, these are the symptoms of right. But just know, of course, in real life and after um, nursing school world, um, you're gonna get out there and realize that there is so much gray. And so like, you could sit there and be like, oh, if, they, if you hear left-sided heart failure, you can start thinking, hey, they probably got congestion in their lungs but just know that they might also have some fluid in their body. They might have some edema, et cetera. They might have some JVD. So like, just know that it's not always a black and white textbook in, um, uh, in real life. So, but anyway, so we, we do want you to differentiate these here in that usually when someone has left-sided heart failure, when I'm talking about left-sided heart failure, I'm talking about left ventricular failure. Um, and, oh, and by the way, like there is other types, there's like systolic heart failure, diastolic heart failure. We, we don't, we don't go in depth into those. We really just talk about left versus right. So if you're starting to study those, I would stop. Um, if you go to my school, I don't know about other schools. Um, so, um, left-sided heart failure is the left ventricle. And in order to better understand why this is the way that it is, you definitely want to maybe review your anatomy if you're not very good with your heart anatomy. But if my left ventricle is failing, we have to think about where this traffic jam is going. So if my left ventricle can't pump blood forward, if I'm backing up from my left ventricle, where am I going? Well, I go into my left atrium. And then if I back up from there, where do I go? I go into my lungs. So that's why with left-sided heart failure, fluid backs up or there's that traffic jam um, where you new know, stuff can't move forward and it's backing up into my lungs and leading to a lot of uncomfortable respiratory breathing symptoms, et cetera. Whereas on the right side, you have to think about the right ventricle. What does the right ventricle back up into? It backs up into the right atrium. And if we back up from there, where does it go? Well, I have blood vessels that go up into my neck in my beautiful brain. And then I also have um, blood vessels that go down oh, oh, to the rest of my body. And um, they, um, uh, what do you call it? go to like my abdominal cavity to my legs, et cetera. Um, so when I have right-sided heart failure and there's that backup or that congestion, um, I'm going to have it in the rest of my body in my neck all the way down to my toes. So kind of going a little deeper here, left-sided heart failure, predominantly they're going to have lung symptoms because of where it's backing up. They're going to complain of not being able to breathe. They're going to complain of, you know, having difficulty thinking, um, when it comes to, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, when it comes to that, because like some people find that confusing, is you have to think about the left ventricles, the powerhouse is supposed to be getting blood to the rest of my body. But if I'm not getting good cardiac output, um, I'm not going to be getting good flow to my brain. So I'm not going to be able to get things out and up. Um, and so therefore, um, I'm not going to be able to think very well, or I can have like, you know, like, uh, I can't have change in level of consciousness, but can, um, you know, I can have some issues with my cognition as well. Um, but mostly it's going to be respiratory symptoms. And you can see some others here. These are, none of these are my beautiful, um, 
uh, what do you call it, pictures. I do not create any of this and I give full credit to um, the copyright here. Um, these are great. I love using them and I highly recommend them, but I am not being paid to sell these or anything. I'm just trying to CYA or um, cover my ass. Um, and so um, at the end of the day here, uh, what do you call it? Um, you can see a lot of the symptoms are all around breathing. So orthopnea, that's difficulty lying down and breathing at the same time. Um, they can have exertional dyspnea or um, difficulty walking and breathing at the same time. Um, they can have cyanosis, they can have um, blood tinge sputum, you can see cough. Uh, and you want to think with this patient, it's fluid. So remember, the lung sounds are going to be wet or coarse crackles. Um, they can be breathing fast as well. They can have confusion with that think the cognition or thinking issues. So then there's right-sided heart failure. This patient has predominant symptoms in the rest of the body. Like I said, it backs up into the necks. They can have neck symptoms like jugular vein distension where they have these very torturous thick veins in their neck. And then they also can have um, uh, enlargement in their abdomen, like their organs, their liver and spleen can be um, enlarged, or they can have what's called ascites, which is like a pregnant belly, um, where um, they're just full of fluid in their abdomen, and it can go all the way down um, into their legs as well. Um, and weight gain can happen. Um, so these patients tend to have fluid in more places. So since it's the rest of their body, so um, they're going to tend to, you know, have um, increased fluctuations in their weight. They're also going to be tired because they're full of fluid and they're dragging around a whole bunch of extra weight. So there's a lot of complications that can happen from heart failure. Um, fluid starts moving to all the wrong places. They can have things like pleural effusion, um, which can lead to diff difficulty, you know, with the lungs can expand. We talked about this in the first section, lungs can expand. Um, it becomes difficult to breathe and it can be infected and have a lot of issues. Uh, these patients are very high risk for dysrhythmias. They are most high risk for atrial fibrillation. That's the most common um, dysrhythmia, which is why I always tell you, you're going to want to know that one. Um, but they're also at risk for sudden cardiac death, um, VTAC, VFib, those ventricular dysrhythmias. Because you have to think about if there's something wrong with my muscle, where does electricity get conducted through my muscle? So if I'm having a problem, um, any cell death or dysfunction in my muscle, it's going to affect my ability to conduct electricity. Um, blood is pooling. So these people are high risk for blood clots and stroke. Now, this does not mean that they're all on anticoagulants. We'll talk about it. They're only going to be on anticoagulants if they have AFib, but um, they are high risk for this. So we want to try to prevent that. And then, like I said, the big so what here is they're not getting perfusion to their organs. The kidneys and other organs can start to fail as a result of heart failure. So there's a variety of diagnostic testing uh, tests that we can do. So we're going to get some labs. So we want to check what their electrolytes are because they can have fluid and electrolyte imbalances. And we want to know what their kidney function is because like I said, the kidneys can go into failure and they're very selfish if they're not getting cardiac output. So um, we might check like potassium, um, serum creatinine. Um, we also want to check because these patients sometimes, even though like the, it's the most common cause of, or not the most common, but it's one of the common causes of it is to have like an MI or a heart attack, but these patients are also going to be at risk for more heart attacks because they're not getting perfusion to their beautiful, beautiful heart um, because they're, they don't have that good cardiac output. Um, so we want to check their biomarkers and see if they're having any infarction, uh, things like that. Um, we also want to check for plaque problems and um, blockages like uh, a lipid profile. Um, and that's going to help us to kind of see like, you know, because they're going to be really high risk for having um, coronary artery disease and um, MIs and blockages. And so um, there's a lot of plaque problems with these patients. They usually have a lot of other cardiovascular risk factors. So we're going to check that out because um, we want to definitely like a lot of we're going to talk about this soon. A lot of management of heart failure is managing other problems and preventing them from having um, increased workload on their heart. Um, I'm going to talk about the BNP in a minute. Other things we might do is like a chest X-ray, a chest X-ray. I could talk. I um, mean, look at this beautiful, big old, big heart. I mean, it's, it's beautiful to me, but it's, it's probably not beautiful. This patient probably doesn't feel like it's beautiful. This is a lot bigger than what it's supposed to be. Look how much space is taken up in that lung. So this is big old juicy heart. But remember, bigger isn't always better. 
Um, we're also going to look for abnormal rhythms because like I said, they're going to be prone to it because their electricity can't be conducted on their um, heart muscle as easily. So then I have these two star, the BNP and the echo. And the reason is because these are very specific to heart failure and they give some very important information. First, we have what's called a BNP, which is a brain natriuretic peptide. And what this does is this tells us um, how much fluid stretch is in the heart. Um, and so it pretty much tells us a fluid load. And we use this lab um, in order to um, help us to, uh, what do you call it, um, kind of see when a patient comes in with heart failure, it can help to diagnose it. It can also help to monitor and treat them. So if it's elevated, it's usually going to be my sign, hey, they may need diuretics. They may be in an acute exacerbation. Um, and we like it less than 100 um, for, the, for the BNP. Give me a second, sorry, my cat's being an asshole. Excuse me. Get, 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 please. Thank you. Um, and excuse my language. If you're offended by in my language, I'm very thoroughly sorry, but it comes out naturally, especially when I'm up late at night making these videos. So yes. So, um, so BMP is going to tell me about fluid stretch and it's going to tell um, me how much um, fluid is on my heart, which is going to help direct treatment. Now I don't look as the nurse and say, oh, you know, that they need this much diuretic, but I can look and say, hey, their BMP is elevated and tell the doctor and they can make a decision about treatment. And usually it's going to be, give me some diuretics. So there's also an echocardiogram. This is super important because an echocardiogram helps to tell me um, what do you call them? What, uh, what do you call them? like what my ejection fraction is. What an ejection fraction is, is effectively it tells me um, how, like how much blood is coming out of my heart every minute. So like an ejection fraction is like, it's pretty much measuring what's the percentage of blood from my ventricle that is actually able to leave or getting pumped out. So most people, and like, you're going to see it vary depending on like where you're at, but most people are going to be somewhere like 55 to 65, 60 to 60. I would say like 60 to 70 is a little on the high side, but like 55 to 65 is usually considered pretty normal somewhere in there, 60 to 65. If you want to play it safe, yeah, I would say like 60 to 65 is pretty normal. Um, because I don't think I'm going to have to probably, uh, yeah, I need to add a slide <clears throat> that has the normals here. Because I thought I had the normals here, but I think it's because in class I have an actual um, worksheet that I do, but I need to add a slide here that says these normals. Um, so we want the BMP less than 100. And then the echocardiogram, we want the ejection fraction to be, you know, 55 to 65 or 60 to 65 percent. So I'm um, kind of in that range because that's saying like, hey, that's over half of the blood that's in your ventricle is getting pumped out to your body. Imagine some of these patients with heart failure, their ejection fraction is sometimes less than 5%. That means less than 5% of the fluid and blood that is in my left ventricle is actually being pumped out to the rest of the body. That's really, really, really poor function. Um, so this is how um, severe it can get. So you're, a lot of times we're going to measure the severity or where they're at with their heart failure on their ejection fraction. Like if I get a report on a patient, they're like, hey, their ejection fraction's 10%. I mean, I know that this patient's probably struggling and I need to decrease that workload of their heart um, very well. Now, if it's like 40 or 50, I'm not going to be like, oh, they okay. I don't need to worry about it. I'm still going to decrease the workload of their heart, but I'm going to be much more concerned about someone with a low ejection fraction. So effectively, the ones that are very specific here are going to be that BNP, tell me about how much fluid stretches on my heart, and then the echocardiogram, which is going to tell me how, how's my pumping ability. Um, we can't directly measure contractility very well. Like um, when we talk about hemodynamics, you'll learn about it in um, your, uh, your uh, complex class. Um, but um, you know, one of the best ways that we can do it is look at that ejection fraction um, and looking at some of those other measures to see how well, what's my pumping ability. So how do we improve pumping ability since we know this is a pumping problem? So this is kind of where I'm getting into that the medications that we're giving are going to help, but probably not in the way that you're thinking they're going to. Um, so first, there's medications that help the heart to pump better. Like literally their job is to increase the pumping ability. And I have digoxin listed here, and this is one that is used. It's not used as often as some others are. There's a lot of like new age stuff that they're doing for heart failure. And just depending on the top, like the cause, um, we have like the um, infusion pumps that people can go home on, like milrinone and stuff like that. That's a positive inotrope as well. So there's other ones too. And if they're in acute exacerbation, we're going to use stronger stuff like IV stuff. Um, 
like continuous drips. But um, at a med surge level, we teach you about the Jackson. It's a positive inotrope. And we'll talk about it here soon. That helps the, um, the heart to actually have better contractility or better squeeze to get that good cardiac output. So you probably are thinking that I'm given diuretics, ACEs and ARBs, beta blockers, vasodilators, et cetera, to decrease blood pressure. Because so far, all we've talked about with these meds is that they decrease blood pressure. But I also talked about in my hypertension lecture about it's so important to always remember and keep in mind um, why um, in a question, when it's asking, how do I know this med is effective? What disease process is it talking about? So when I'm talking about these meds for hypertension, I'm hoping for a lower blood pressure, but for heart failure, a lot of these meds are being used. They might help with hypertension, that vasoconstriction that I'm having, um, you know, and stuff like that it'll help lower the number, but really we're giving them because we're trying to decrease that workload. We're trying to stop the compensation. So effectively think we have meds that are going to help with that contractility, help with the problem of heart failure. And then we're going to have meds that are going to stop the compensation or decrease the amount of workload that my heart is having to overcome. So I'm treating the problem, treating the compensation. So diuretics, they're going to treat um, that compensation because I have this extra fluid from my um, RAS system. So it's going to help to counteract that. They also help with symptoms too, which I'll talk about here soon. Um, ACEs and ARBs. So if you remember ACEs and ARBs, they block that renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And that is one of those compensations that's killing me. It's increasing my sodium, my water, those resistance in the vessels, and it's making it so hard. So definitely um, need that to help block that. And then we also have our fight or flight is activated. So we need to block that and we can use beta blockers to block that. So using ACEs and ARBs and beta blockers has shown to significantly improve um, outcomes for heart failure patients. So we're giving it again, don't think, hey, I'm really hoping for a lower blood pressure. Yeah, that's nice. But what I want is less stress on the heart, better contractility. Because like, for example, like if I give medications like ACEs and ARBs and, my vas and I'm less vasoconstricted, hopefully my heart doesn't have to work so hard, pump out against that resistance, et cetera. If I have less fluid on board um, than um, with a diuretic, then I can actually pump more effectively. This is that Frank Starling's law, less stretch, um, less, um, you know, demand for oxygen, less stress on the heart. Um, we also, again, like, because there's so much vasoconstriction, we're going to use um, beta blockers to block the sympathetic nervous system, ACEs and ARBs to block that RAS, which is going to help to decrease some of that vasoconstriction. But a lot of times these patients also need vasodilators. I want to open up those blood vessels to allow the heart to be able to seamlessly just pump that blood forward. Um, so, yes. Um, I also want to manage other conditions that they have because effectively I don't want anything stressing the heart out or making it harder. So this is going to be things like hypertension. I cannot afford that vasoconstriction. I need my blood vessels to be relaxed. Um, if I'm having um, uh, like, you know, um, high amounts of plaques, if I'm having blockages happening in my heart, my heart does not have the bandwidth to manage blockages, heart attacks, all that stuff. I need to manage that stuff. So if I need stents placed, if I need to up my, um, you know, uh, statin medications to help treat my high lipids, um, whatever I need to do in order to decrease that stress of the heart, I want to do it. Um, dysrhythmias, they decrease your cardiac output, they stress your heart out, um, the alteration in the, in the rhythm, um, cause I, I wake up going back now, I think I used to have, uh, like a bunch of stuff of, maybe it's in hypertension. I talk, yeah, it's in hypertension. I talk about recipe for blood pressure and cardiac output. I'm just, I'm having, I'm having a moment, which you won't understand unless you're a squirrel brain like me, where you're answering a question that you asked yourself like 20 minutes ago. So anyway, moving on, but dysrhythmias, they, um, they, they are another thing that leads to decreased cardiac output. So again, they stress my heart out. They require more oxygen. Um, all that stuff with the heart rate can change how my cardiac output is. And on top of that, I want to do other things that are going to decrease stress on the heart or avoid things that are going to stress my heart out. So any temperature extremes, too hot, too cold, is going to be too hard on the heart. So I definitely want to avoid those. Um, emotional stress. So I definitely want to, um, these patients, they may need therapy or psychiatric treatments. If they have abnormal stress, they may need to alter their lifestyle when it comes to the stress in their life when possible. 
Um, oxygen therapy is key because I have a supply demand issue here. And so I have not enough supply to meet the demand. And I have this demand, 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 demand that's going on in my body. So I need to meet that with some extra oxygen a lot of times. Vaccinations, I cannot afford to get sick. Um, if I have heart failure, my body cannot, it's not about like the immune system as, as hard as it is on the heart because um, there's so much that's activated when I get sick. Um, inflammation can occur and other problems can happen. Um, and it just stresses the heck out of my heart. And so I can't afford that. So really good hygiene education to prevent infection. And these are people that are going to need to make sure they get vaccinated for things like pneumonia, the flu, et cetera. Um, and then we talked about those biventricular pacemakers when we went through dysrhythmias. This is one that helps to sync the ventricles because sometimes they can get out of sync with each other. And um, they definitely tend to have better cardiac output when they're in sync and working together. So digoxin. Um, digoxin is a medication that helps to increase my heart squeeze or my heart contractility. Um, it's a positive inotrope. And um, the thing to keep in mind with digoxin is it has a couple different roles. It increases my heart squeeze, but it also decreases my heart rate and my electricity. So if you remember, we talked about digoxin can be used to, well, I don't know if I talked about it, but I, I might have. But digoxin can be used to treat um, atrial fibrillation and other, um, uh, like that's the main one that's used to treat when it comes to rapid rhythms, because it can decrease my electricity and convert it. And it can also decrease my heart rate and control that rate, which is great. Um, so when it comes to it, um, when we're giving digoxin for heart failure, we're not usually giving it for the, to lower my heart rate or to um, work on my electricity. We're usually giving it to help with the contractility. Um, now we can sometimes do both because sometimes they're an AFib and they have the low contractility. So sometimes it's a, you know, you get two bangs for your buck, but um, overall, usually we're giving this for heart squeeze when it comes to this. Cause it's a, when we're talking about it as a positive inotrope, we're hoping to get more heart squeeze, muscle contraction, AKA cardiac output. So the therapeutic level for digoxin is going to be 0.5 to 2.0. Um, and this is really key because this is a very toxic med. And when um, you have to think about what it does, if I have too much of a med that lowers my heart electricity and lowers my heart rate, what's going to happen if it gets too low? My heart is going to be so slow. My heart rate is going to be super low. Um, and so I definitely want to, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, make sure that uh, when we're, you know, when we're doing um, this therapy that I'm watching for these symptoms and that um, we're going to be monitoring those lab levels, but I need to tell patients what the symptoms are. So early on, if a patient has digoxin toxicity, they're going to have things like gastrointestinal symptoms like nausea, vomiting. Um, they can have vision changes and see halos around the lights. And so GI and um, vision stuff is going to be early. And then the late symptoms are going to be, like I said, like if you're having too much of something, it's going to be stuff like that severe bradycardia, really low heart rate, heart block and stuff comes up. So this is another one like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, um, that I'm not going to give if the heart rate's less than 60. And the patient needs to know how to take their apical pulse when they are um, taking this, because we want to get the most accurate, because a lot of these patients, um, they may have AFib. And so we want to get the most accurate pulse that we can and make sure that we are treating it um, if it's safe. And then just to kind of remind you about the relationship between um, potassium and digoxin, because um, a lot of patients that um, have heart failure are going to be on diuretics and on digoxin. And so since um, some diuretics can either increase or decrease your potassium, I'm going to be worried about the interaction here. So something to keep in mind is a low potassium, having um, you know, low potassium, like if I was on a potassium wasting diuretic, like a loop diuretic or a thiazide diuretic it's gonna increase my digoxin level, or in other words, it's gonna make my digoxin toxic. Whereas um, a high potassium level, um, which would be, um, what do you call it? Um, like, a, so like if people were taking potassium sparing diuretics, et cetera, um, it's going to decrease my digoxin levels or make it not as therapeutic. Um, so they work inversely. So in other words, if I have a, like, it's not that you can't give them together. You can give diuretics and digoxin together, but I need to be watching that potassium closely because if I have a patient that's on a diuretic and their potassium is low, like, let's say you had a question that's like, Hey, you're giving a patient is this safe to give, or what's your best action? Or, you know, how those nursing school questions are so fun to read. Um, and so what you want to always keep in mind here is, is that, um, if my potassium is low, I'm not going to, um, I, what do you call it? Um, if my potassium is low, I'm not going to give that to Joxin because it's going to just pretty much be asking for the toxicity. And, um, 
we don't worry as much about it not being therapeutic, but we should, because like, you know, I mean, it's not necessarily life or death, but the medicine's not going to be effective. So then that can lose some of that heart squeeze. So uh, we, we talk mostly, most of the questions you're going to see is going to say, Hey, the potassium's low. Do you give this med? And we do not give this med if my potassium's low, I have to replace my potassium first. My potassium needs to be normal before I can give this to Jackson. Um, the other parts of heart failure are going to be things like managing fluid overload. So like fluid balance is so key in these patients. The biggest thing I'm going to do to decrease their fluid load is going to be diuretics. And this is really going to help increase their comfort. I'll talk about this more in a minute, but you know, you have to think about it. most of their symptoms. I can't breathe. I'm full of fluid. I'm so tired because I'm full of fluid. So decreasing their fluid load can definitely help improve their quality of life. Um, so things as the nurse I'm going to do is doing close intake and output monitoring. And I would definitely know, um, we caught how to like, you know, um, as the nurse, you need to calculate this. And I know a lot of times you think the computer does it for you, but um, really as the nurse, you're the one that should be watching a lot of your eyes nose. Now, if you're on med surge and stuff, yes, the texts do like empty your Foley's and stuff, but you can't always, um, every unit's different. So it's good. What I'm saying is it's good to get into the habit as the nurse of you owning the eyes and O's. And with the patient with heart failure, we're going to watch them what we call strict eyes and O's, where we're going to be watching it super closely. So I need to see everything that's going in and coming out of that patient to see if they're balanced. Um, we're going to do daily weights and they're going to learn how to do this at home too, to see how they're doing. If they have a weight gain of three pounds over two days or three to five pounds over a week, it's going to be considered concerning. Um, education wise, um, we call, we want to do a, uh, what do you call it? A low sodium diet because, um, sodium, uh, water follows sodium. So we're going to usually put them on the dash diet or cardiovascular diet. And usually they're going to be restricted to, um, two gram sodium. They might even have less than that it might be like one and a half gram. It just depends on the patient, but we're usually going to do low sodium cardiovascular diet. Um, and then they're usually going to be on a fluid restriction. These patients are going to feel thirsty because they, but they're full of fluid. Um, but a lot of times they still feel thirsty because they just don't have fluid where they need to. And, um, what do you call it? Um, we are trying to, uh, get rid of a lot of that, like we're trying to lower their sodium and stuff like that. So a lot of times they can have a sense of thirst. So we can tell them to like, um, it, it's, a lot of it has to do with the diuretics and the other treatments they're receiving, I should say, is like probably the biggest thing. Um, but they're going to have this feeling of thirst all the time. Like they need more fluid, but they are full of fluid. They do not need the fluid. So um, you need to monitor. So what I usually do with these patients is when I go in in the morning, I mark their cup to say like, okay, when I first came in, here's where it was at. And then I kind of keep an eye um, throughout the day. And I make Make sure to tell like the tech if they fill it up for me hey let me know because they're on a fluid restriction so we can all be on the same page oh excuse my guys oh because something else you want to keep in mind too is is that with these um with these patients that like sometimes they can be very manipulative you'll go in the room and if they if they don't know you they'll be like hey come in here they'll be like hey can you give me some water and they they know that you maybe don't know them and they don't maybe know how much fluid they've had so they can be super tricky so don't let them pull one over on you um needless to say uh, so the um, low sodium diet, watching uh, low, uh, like uh, fluid restriction, watching their um, weight closely, I'm going to be in charge of their intake and output. And we do an activity in my class where I kind of have my students go through and calculate intake and output. That's very good practice. And you definitely want to know your conversions and stuff um, for, um, you know, converting, like if they have this much juice, you know, how much does it equal in milliliters, et cetera. Um, so, um, we definitely want to watch that closely and let them know when to report that, uh, other foods to avoid. We want to think of anything that's high in salt. So we don't want to have any added salt at the table. It's not that they can have no salt, but we just don't want to add a whole lot of extra and keep in mind these patients, a lot of them are going to be older and like a lot of people, they just lose their sense of taste. And so they, they salt everything up. So usually we use Mrs. Dash as a cardiovascular substitute, um, for patients that um, are on a low sodium diet. But the problem is Mrs. Dash is a salt substitute therefore it has a lot of potassium so we want to kind of keep that in mind now that might be a great thing because maybe i'm potassium wasting diuretics um, but it can um, cause problems so we definitely want to be monitoring it closely um, especially if they're on the jejoxin and everything too um, anything, I think with high sodium foods, anything that's canned is going to be high in sodium, anything with processed, um, especially think like your deli meats and things like that are going to be um, things you want to avoid. You want to avoid dining out when possible. And um, dairy is also a lot of times with the fat and stuff like that. And it's not the best choice for heart failure. Um, overall, how, what do we do to manage their symptoms um, and help with their activity tolerance? We're going, we have to tell them, like I told you at the beginning, there's no cure. 
Um, so all we can do is manage their symptoms like, you know, and it, it, it may be different now, but you know, when I was in nursing school and learning about heart failure, I remember like thinking it's so sad because most of the people that have heart failure, you know, have about like a 10 year lifespan. Now, a lot of people can live longer and stuff like that, but um, like a lot of people don't live long because of complications because the heart is just working so dang hard. So we want to do whatever we can to make them comfortable and um, decrease that workload on the heart to allow to prolong their life. Um, and so medications to decrease symptoms, that's going to be stuff like diuretics, decrease that shortness of breath, decrease that edema so they can have some quality of life, get up, get moving, or at least even just enjoy resting. Because for some people, they can't even like sit and rest because it's so hard to breathe. Um, small frequent meals helps. They're not going to feel like eating. It's hard to breathe and eat at the same time, but we want to encourage those small frequent meals because nutrition is so key to prevent infection, um, to strengthen them. They've got these weak, this weak uh, heart muscle. We definitely need all the nutrition we can get. Um, increased walking is tolerated. So walking is a great exercise for these patients. They may not tolerate a lot of walking, but we definitely want to encourage it where they can. Teach them energy conservation techniques. That's the resting, um, resting and then restarting activities like taking breaks. Um, and then like it says, like after exercise or anything strenuous, definitely pan, plan rest periods. Um, we want to prevent complications in these patients. So uh, we need to do very good education with these patients and make sure that they're getting treatment for all their problems. So um, we can prevent complications. Like if they're having a dysrhythmia, like AFib, give them, you know, an antidysrhythmic, treat that rhythm. If they're, um, you know, if they're in AFib, they're going to need to be on anticoagulants. Like I said, not every patient with heart failure is going to be on um, anticoagulation. So don't just think, hey, they have heart failure, blood is pooling, they need an anticoagulant. They only need anticoagulant if they have AFib. Um, if we can't convert the AFib, then we will decrease the rate, you know, do stuff like beta blockers and stuff like that. Cause we want to decrease the workload. We don't want that heart racing too fast. We want to do really good medication education. Cause like I mentioned, there aren't a lot of medications that could lead to some serious problems. So we want to measure the pulse rate closely. Um, we want to watch for orthostatic hypotension. A lot of the meds that they're on can cause that orthostasis. We want to um, teach them if they are an anticoagulation and remember only if they have AFib and heart failure, um, then we want to teach them how to prevent trauma trauma and um, signs and symptoms of bleeding so that they can report that. Uh, for digoxin, we want to talk about the digoxin toxicity, um, regular lab monitoring, the signs, of the early and late signs of the digoxin toxicity. Um, the changes to the diet are really key um, in order to prevent medication complications. So we can talk about like the potassium, making sure we're getting enough potassium in, et cetera. And um, just keep in mind, this is kind of like everything else we talk about. Like a lot of people think they can outrun, you know, their poor cardiovascular health. We can give you medications, but if you're not treating a lot of the underlying issues or changing your lifestyle, you can continue to have worsening problems. So diet and exercise is key and decrease other risk factors like smoking. That is the basics on heart failure. I feel like I could talk a lot longer about it, but um, hopefully you enjoyed this. And um, yeah, I had a fun time too. I, I think this is actually my last lecture for cardiac for that I'm recording right now. So I'm a little sad. I'll have a small moment of silence before I stop this recording, but I hope you enjoyed it like I did. See you next time.